values. Since its founding in 1827, Lindenwood has been about educating the whole person. Most of all, Lindenwood is about its students. Lindenwood is located just 25 miles west of the St. Louis Gateway Arch, and since the early 1990s, it has been the fastest growing university in the Midwest. Something special is happening at Lindenwood, something new, something different. Lindenwood is helping to change the way we think about higher education. Not many other schools can offer the benefits of a liberal arts education combined with the diversity and resources of a larger university. What does this mean? First, it means that Lindenwood isn't simply a place you go to earn a degree. It's an experience. It's part of one's life. It's where young people form the values that will stay with them the rest of their lives. With over 4,000 students living on campus, Lindenwood is an active, thriving campus community. It's extremely important to Lindenwood that every student has the chance to take part in the activities and events that make up campus life. It's a chance to go away to college, whether your family lives on the other side of the country or just a few miles away. At the center of life on campus, of course, are academics. Part of what makes Lindenwood special is its ability to maintain the personality of a small school while being able to offer numerous degree programs through its different schools. Yet class sizes are small. We have a student newspaper, we have a television station, we have a website, we have places where they can showcase their short films, we have a radio station, we have all of these media outlets where our students can get hands-on, real-world experience, and they can learn from people who are actually in the business. Students learn natural and social sciences in state-of-the-art classrooms and labs. A greenhouse attached to Young Hall also gives students hands-on experience in plant sciences and horticulture. Pre-professional programs enable graduates to go on to medical, veterinary, dental, and optometry schools. The School of Business and Entrepreneurship is a diverse and flexible program that teaches business in a way that prepares students for a wide variety of careers all over the world. Above all, the School of Business and Entrepreneurship wants its graduates to get jobs and succeed, and they do. In the arts, there are no artificial boundaries. All students, freshmen through graduate, are expected to audition and participate. And students serve meaningful internships at various professional production companies such as Opera Theatre St. Louis, the Muni, Hot City Theatre, and Stages. Also located in the J. Scheidegger Center is the state-of-the-art LUTV HD studio, home of Lindenwood Station. The station cable casts on Charter Communications and AT&T UVerse, as well as streams live on Lindenwood's website. Students write, produce, direct, and edit live news and sports programming, and get professional hands-on experience using the latest technology. Communications students have the opportunity to reach thousands of people with LUTV. Lindenwood's radio station, KCLC, is one of the few university radio stations that gives students on-air experience in a major metropolitan radio market. Beyond academics, Lindenwood students compete on dozens of different athletic teams. Harlan C. Hunter Stadium is where the Lindenwood Lions football team plays its home games. The newly renovated stadium also hosts soccer, lacrosse, and field hockey. The Robert F. Highland Performance Arena is the home for Lindenwood's successful volleyball, basketball, and wrestling teams. Also on the main campus are a new track and the Lou Brock Baseball and Softball Complex. Like its students, Lindenwood's athletes are known for success. Lindenwood has numerous national championships. Perhaps the most exciting thing about Lindenwood is its affordability. You'll often find Lindenwood keeping its costs low at times when other institutions are raising their tuitions annually. So what is the value of a Lindenwood education? Because of the values they receive at Lindenwood, our students are the well-rounded and responsible citizens and leaders of tomorrow. We measure our success by the success of our students. At Lindenwood University, it really is all about you.
Uh, good evening and uh, welcome to a very special edition of the Mark Cox Show tonight here on FM News Talk 97.1. We're bringing you this broadcast live tonight from the Jay Scheidegger Center on the campus of Lindenwood University, where we're hosting the Missouri Governor Candidates Forum sponsored by the St. Louis County and St. Charles County Republican Central Committees. Uh, glad you're with us tonight. Uh, we'll be here from 7 to 9. We're going to carry this forum in its entirety, except for two commercial breaks. Just for the folks on the radio, for your purposes, uh, we're broadcasting this, we're simulcasting this, along with Lindenwood University Television on LUTV on Charter and AT&T UVerse, and also we are live streaming the video on our website at 971talk.com. This, uh, for your knowledge at home, is a forum for the gubernatorial candidates. It is not a debate. Uh, each one of our candidates will be given time to answer the same question. So instead of arguments, you're going to hear the candidates' best answers on how they would govern. They have been specifically asked not to engage with each other. Uh, the format tonight is nothing new for our candidates, by the way. It may be for the audience. They have participated in these forums around the state. And in uh, this particular case tonight, and here on the radio, I want you to know, this is an important note, uh, the questions you will hear tonight have been collected from voters. They are not my questions. Um, and we've already talked to the audience about the applause. You're going to hear applause in the background here at the top of the show, and again uh, a little later, probably when we go to a commercial break. But right now, it's time to get started with this uh, 2016 Missouri Governors of Candidates Forum. And ladies and gentlemen, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the candidates uh, participated in a random drawing earlier to see what order they would appear on our panel. So it's time for us to introduce tonight's candidates for the office of Missouri Governor for the Republican Party. Number one, ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce Mr. John Bruner. John is the uh, former CEO of Vijon Incorporated and is a candidate for governor of the state of Missouri. Number two in position tonight, Lieutenant Governor Peter Kinder. The current sitting Lieutenant Governor of the state of Missouri. Number three tonight in order, Catherine Hanaway. Former Missouri House Speaker and also former U.S. Attorney. And uh, last in our order this evening, Eric Greitens. Eric is the founder of a veteran support agency known as The Mission Continues. He is also an author. And uh, it is time for us to get started with tonight's forum. Good evening to all of you. Candidates know the rules, and I have the questions that haven't been out of my greedy little fingers since I had them handed to me earlier. So we're ready to start. Uh, the candidates understand how this is going to go tonight. I will ask these questions in order, and then we'll go down the table, and each person will get a chance to uh, get the first answer to each question as we move through the night. So before we get started with our questions, we are going to do our introductions. Each one of the candidates will get two minutes for an opening statement. And for the candidates' knowledge, and I think you know this already, um, Alan here will hold up a yellow piece of paper at the one-minute mark to give you an idea. So during your answers, you have 90 seconds. During your opening statements, you have two minutes. Uh, we'll start with Mr. Bruner. Thank you. It's good to be here. And also for you at home or listening on the radio, it's a wonderful opportunity to join the citizens of Missouri in this great uh, gubernatorial forum. You know, I'm John Bruner. I'm a businessman. I've also had the privilege to serve on Christian missions around the world. It's also been an honor to serve as a platoon commander in the United States Marine Corps. And I would like to offer at this time a salute to all you veterans out there here and at home. You know, not everyone on this stage is a lifetime constitutional conservative. But I've been fighting this battle for decades. These values, these for good candidates and good constitutional principles. My first value here is fighting for life. And I will do everything to stand for life. And for our First Amendment, specifically our religious freedom. And let me be clear, our First Amendment, our religious freedom is not for sale. 
I will defend the Second Amendment, all of our amendments, the Tenth Amendment, the rights for our states. Now, not everyone on the stage here are outsiders. I've never served in political office. I'm uh, not here to extend a political career or jumpstart a political career. I'm not looking for a job. I'm here simply to do the job. And my friends, I can't be bought. I'm the only one here tonight, though, who has had a career in business. I've brought billions of dollars of business back to the state and, and brought thousands of jobs here to Missouri. With the results we can in renewing our economy, we'll get the jobs going, we'll get the schools going, we'll get the roads and bridges fixed. It's all about results. In my business, if you go out of business, you go out of business because of failure of results. If you're looking for results for a change, I'm your choice for governor. I'm John Bruner, and I appreciate your vote. If we could uh, hold the applause, that'd be great, all right? Let's give, let's give each candidate enough time, please. Please respect that for me. Mr. Kinder. Thank you for this opportunity. I'm honored. I think in choosing a Republican candidate to go up against the opposition in November, you have to look for a trusted conservative, a, a person whose record indicates they can be trusted on this whole range of issues, and a trusted winner. I've won three elections in this state, statewide elections, and I have never lost. I have come from behind. I've won when I've been outspent. And we're going up against a formidable opponent on the other side who has also never lost an election, who's won twice statewide. I'm the candidate who's figured out how to actually unite urban and rural Missouri to put together a majority and win, as I won in 2008 and 12 the only winner out of 11 candidates on the Republican ticket running those two years. Trusted conservative across the board on the issues. I'm the only candidate with the Missouri Right to Life Defender of Life on my award, award on my wall for d passing the first bill banning partial birth abortion. The only candidate in the race who has the National Rifle Association's highest rating of A+. I'm very proud of that record. I'm very proud of the fact that for the past three and a half years, I've been in the trenches with activists all across this state battling against Common Core to make sure that that virus does not sink its roots into Missouri soil. Battling alongside the activists for our property rights. And also in this legislative session, battling to guarantee you, the voters of this state, a chance to pass Senate Joint Resolution 39 to guarantee us the highest level of protection for our religious liberties. I want you to make that decision. I don't trust elites in corporate boardrooms to foreclose that and cut off that debate. I want Missourians at the ballot box to have the chance to build on my work in strengthening our religious liberty by passing or considering passage of SJR 39. Senator Governor, thank you. Ms. Kinder, or Ms. Hanaway, sorry. Thank you very much to our hosts, to those of you who are listening at home, and to those of you who came tonight. And to my dad, I say happy 78th birthday. And thank you so much for teaching us as a family to love each other, to love other people, and to love the Lord. And for teaching us that powerful people should stand up for the underdog. Powerful people and leaders should care about other people and not just promote themselves. And that public service means you serve the public, not just your own interests. And it's a shame that this country and this state has lost sight of that. When Ferguson was burning, who was standing up for the underdog? The people in the neighborhoods, the police officers who were being spat upon and assaulted. When there were protests and unrest at the University of Missouri, who was standing up for the student who just wanted to go to class? As St. Louis has led the nation in the murder rate, who, what state government leader is standing up for the people who are cowering in their homes? The person who should be doing it is the state's chief law enforcement official, Chris Coster, the guy who wants to be your next governor, and yet he's done nothing Thing to defend this state. As a former prosecutor, I stood up for the underdog against fraudsters. I stood up for children who were abused. When I was Speaker of the House, I protected the unborn and your Second Amendment rights, making concealed carry the law in this state for the first time in our state's history. If I get the chance to be your next governor, I'm going to bring conservative solutions to the state's toughest problems. 
We can bring jobs to this state. We can make our streets safer. And we can make Missouri safe and strong again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Greitens. I'm Eric Greitens. And I'm here tonight with a very simple message. Our politicians have failed us, and we can't trust them to fix the mess that they've created. I've never run for office before. I'm a Navy SEAL, an entrepreneur, and a concerned husband and father. But I can't stand by and watch as career politicians continue to hurt real people. You know, Missouri has become a state known for serial corruption, national embarrassment, and epic failure. Think about the crisis and lawlessness at Ferguson that spun out of control due to a lack of leadership from our governor, or the crisis at the University of Missouri, or the crisis in our economy where today we are 47th in growth and 42nd in wage growth. People around Missouri are hurting. Businesses are leaving, and people who are lucky enough to have a job haven't seen a raise for six or seven years. And that's because the economic and political system here in Missouri has become so rigged that oftentimes it's difficult to tell the difference between the lawmakers and the lawbreakers. Government at every level is broken. They fail to do what they're supposed to do and love to do what they shouldn't do. You've got the VA failing veterans, the EPA harassing farmers, the IRS targeting people of faith. You need a governor who will stand up and protect you. You know, my boxing coach used to always say, if you want different, do different. If you want to get a different result, then you're going to have to take different action. And if we want to get a different result from our government, then we are going to have to take action. So that's why I invite you to tonight to join me. Go to ericgreitens.com and join our movement, because we know that with strong conservative leadership from outside of the political establishment, we can turn Missouri around and make sure that Missouri's best days are still ahead. All right. <laughs> Mr. Greitens, thank you. And I ask you to hold your applause, please. Just a quick reminder for the folks on the radio side on FM News Talk 97.1, you listen to a special edition of The Mark Cox Show tonight. We are carrying uh, the Governor Candidates Forum from the campus of Lindenwood University. And with that, it is time for us to get started. Candidates, you will have 90 seconds for your answers. Uh, for the sake of saving a little bit of time, uh, when your fellow candidate is done speaking, uh, feel free to start if you're next in order. How about that? That may just make it easier instead of me having to jump in each time. Uh, the first question, we'll start with uh, Mr. Bruner on this one. Mr. Bruner, here's a question, and again, these are from the voters. How do you intend to protect private property against land acquisition by the Department of Natural Resources? Within private property is all of our rights, our civil rights. It's absolutely critical to protect private property. And this overreach of eminent domain for profit and gain should never be allowed. I will stand with our farmers, our ranchers, our business owners, all of our property right owners, and with the help of a strong attorney general, we'll fight back against this encroachment. This is part of the crony capitalism. This is a part of business and government getting together to achieve specific, specialized economic gain. So I pledge, as your governor, I will stand for your property rights, and I will stand against the abuse and overuse and misuse of eminent domain. I'm really glad to have a chance to answer this, because with some of these candidates, you get their assertions and their claims of what they'll do. With me, you know what you'll get in office. Ask the folks, the good folks in the uh, Southern Missouri Ozarks at the Ozarks Property Rights Coalition. Those good people generally between, say, Popper Bluff and Springfield have been battling many of these issues. Ask them. Don't take my word for it. Ask them who has been shoulder to shoulder with them, attending their meetings, answering their phone calls late at night and early in the morning, responding to emails, and being in this battle for property rights against all the federal incursions against our property rights. I've been in the thick of the battle against the EPA, against the Forest Service, against the plan to impose the Ozark River Blue Ways. I didn't see I respect and like each of the others up here, but I didn't see any of them at those meetings uh, or, or interacting with those people's, people in those battles the last three and a half years. I have been there. 
I have not just talked the talk, as all candidates do. I have walked this walk, and Missourians know they will get a fighter for liberty, a fighter for property rights, if I'm honored to be your governor. Thank you very much. I think the answer to the specific question of how you prevent the Missouri Department of Natural Resources from encroaching on private property rights is to appoint a director of the Missouri Department of Natural Resources who won't encroach on private property rights. And as governor, that's the kind of leadership you have to show. I wasn't at the Ozark uh, Blue Ways meetings because I haven't held any office in eight years. I haven't run for any office in 12 years. I've been in the private sector. I've been prosecuting. I've been raising our kids. But I felt compelled to come back to public service because I'm so worried about the direction of our country. And part of the job of governor is to stand up for the Tenth Amendment. And the Tenth Amendment says that any power that isn't given specifically to the federal government is reserved to the states and to the people. So as your governor, I'll stand up when the, gov the federal government tries to overreach through the EPA or the, through the Department of Education bringing common core standards to our state or through the, the fish and wildlife or conservation. And the people I appoint to be directors within state government are going to respect property rights and carry out the same principles that I articulate as governor. Private property rights are among the most important rights that each of us has, and I will always stand up for them as your next governor. Mark, this is a critical question. And the reason why it's being asked by voters in Missouri is because they don't trust career politicians in Jefferson City to protect them. They don't trust them to protect their private property rights. They don't trust them to keep their streets safe. They don't trust them to make sure that we've got quality education. They don't trust them to make sure that we've got a growing economy. We have a problem of trust here in the state of Missouri because career politicians continue to fail us. So here's how we have to stand up to protect pro property rights. First, we have to recognize that this is one of the founding rights that our founding fathers put into the United States Constitution. They recognized how essential it was that you could not take someone's property from them. So first, as a constitutional conservative, you have to go and understand where these rights come from. And the second thing is that you have to recognize that in order to change Jefferson City, we have to bring a team to change Jefferson City. And as an outsider, I'm going to bring with me a team of people who've successfully run farms and ranches, people who've successfully run schools and businesses and hospitals, people who understand that we need a government that's willing to step forward and to protect people. And as an outsider who's coming in, we're going to build that team and we're going to make sure that the people of Missouri are protected from the career politicians who continue to hurt them. All right, Derek Greggins, thank you very much. We've, now again, we've asked you to hold your applause, please, just for the sake of time. Uh, question number two, and this will start with Lieutenant Governor Kinder. How would you specifically shrink the size of state government, meaning taxes, entitlements, regulations, personnel? Where would those cuts come from? I would do throughout the executive branch and appoint people who would look in each of their departments throughout the executive branch to do, again, exactly what I've done in my own office. Each year I have been in a position of leadership. I came in as Senate President Pro Tem and was able, after 53 years of the Democrats running the Missouri Senate, to lay off some ghost employees, and I immediately cut the Senate budget by 20 percent, and senators and the public said they were getting better service for the 20 percent reduction. We then moved the next fiscal year and reduced it further. You then get a point where you can't reduce it anymore on a, on a budget like the Senate budget, but at least it was not increasing at 7 to 8 percent a year as it had been before I came in as the reformer. Now, in the, in the office I'm in now, I am the only person in statewide office who makes this claim. I have returned money unspent out of my office budget allocation each year I have been lieutenant governor. I have gone to the Appropriations Committee, the Budget Committee, and asked them to reduce my budget and still, after the reduction, still return money unspent. It can be done. I've been the most active lieutenant governor I think we've ever had in this state, and I have delivered real value to the people 
in many different fields of endeavor, and I would do that through every executive department of state government, from MoDOT to conservation to, to DNR to everything else. All right, thank you very much. Ms. Hanaway? The size of Missouri's state government is far too large for our state. We have 60,000 state employees approximately. Illinois has the same amount. They're twice as big in population. Step one for reducing the size of government is to reduce the number of state employees, reduce the no amount of money that we are spending so that we can give Missourians an income tax cut. We have to do it responsibly. We have to do it in a way that meets the budgetary needs of the state. But it begins by shrinking this greatly outsized government. Step two, modernize, update, and reduce the amount of income tax people are paying. And then we have to look at priorities. And I think that one of the first things we have to look at is reforming welfare in this state. We are the worst state in the country at moving people from welfare to work. And that doesn't just mean that it costs our state government and our taxpayers a lot of money. It means that it costs families and communities opportunities. The average, the, the all-in welfare package in this state today is $27,000. We have teachers and police officers starting at a lower salary than that. We have got to begin to reform welfare, put people back to work, and create hope and opportunities for families and communities. Very good, Mr. Greitens. We're going to shrink the size of state government by having a people's budget rather than a politician's budget. Let me explain to you how this works today. Today in Jefferson City, what happens is that at the beginning of the year, career politicians get together and they do something called the consensus revenue estimate. Well, they figure out how much tax money they're going to take from you, your businesses, your families. And then they figure out how they're going to spend it all. What we're going to do instead is that we're going to build a budget rooted around our priorities. Today in Jefferson City, they assume that every department of state government gets the same amount of money that they had last year and maybe more. We're going to begin with zero-based budgeting and we're going to build a budget around people's priorities. And then we're going to do the same thing that I did when I was running my own business, the same thing that I did when I started and ran one of the nation's leading organizations to help veterans come home and to reintegrate. We're going to insist on results and accountability. Right now, you look through a $26.9 billion budget, and there are no performance metrics. We should be able to say of every agency of government, this is your mission. And for every line item in the budget, we should be able to tell the people of Missouri what they are getting for the money that they spent. This takes strong leadership, it takes quality leadership, and we can do this with an insistence on results and accountability. Mr. Berner. As an entrepreneur and businessman, I was driven every single day, every month, every year to find efficiencies in our operations. We were up against the largest competitors in America as a small business, as a small entrepreneur. And the only way we could get ahead is through creative initiatives among our entire organization. I'm the only one on this stage that has that experience for over decades in getting the job done. As a successful business person, you're successful because of efficiencies. And as an outsider, I'll bring in new ideas and a business approach to business here in Missouri. It starts with identifying good leaders. I've interviewed thousands of people in my life, my friends, and it's all about finding good people in each of these 16 different departments. It is about clear accountability and setting specific goals and for everybody to run and manage. And then you can get the job done. You look for the gaps, you look for the overlaps, and everybody works together by a team, and you coordinate your efforts. So you find out what the left hand is doing versus the right hand is doing, and you share good ideas from one area to another area. You also share ideas from different states. What the governor of Utah did, reviewing 2,000 different regulations and streamlining his business, and was able to eliminate 386 of them. There's a target and goal I have. 3.8% savings in state government is over a billion dollars. We can get the job done. Mr. Berner, thank you. Our third question will start with uh, Catherine Hanaway. In St. Louis and Kansas City, we have a number of state-controlled school districts right now with at least 13 others approaching that cliff. What is your plan to fix failing school districts? Well, the first thing we have to do is work harder to make sure that school districts don't fail. My grandmother taught in a one-room schoolhouse. My dad taught school. And they 
impressed upon me that we need three important ingredients for a successful education program. Number one, local control. Number two, involved parents. Number three, great teachers. And right now, we need to start taking the steps so that we can prevent more school districts from failing. So chief on that list is to put control back into the hands of local school boards so that they can manage their curriculum and don't have to take a curriculum like Common Core, so that they can manage their personnel and pay hiring bonuses to the best teacher, to recruit the best teachers and to keep the best teachers and put an end to teacher tenure at the statewide level, which forces management principles on local school districts. We need to put parents in the driver's seat so they can make the best decisions about whether their children belong in a charter school, a parochial school, a public school, or the most selfless choice of all, homeschooling. And then we need to cut the budget at the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education and push it out to teachers. We're 41st in teacher pay in this state. We're 47th on average in starting pay. Let's cut the bureaucrats and help the teachers. Mr. Greitens. This is going to take a tremendous amount of leadership, Mark, and it's absolutely possible for us to solve this problem. There are kids across Missouri today, not only in St. Louis and Kansas City, but across Missouri who are hurting. And we have to step forward and solve these problems for them. The first thing that we have to do is we have to oppose Common Core. The federal government should not be setting our curriculum and choosing our textbooks. You know, I was at an elementary school here where I saw a, a girl in third grade who's showing up to school every single day at Robertson Elementary and both of her parents are meth addicts. Now, you can't tell me that there's some bureaucrat in Jefferson City who understands her talents. You can't tell me there's some politician in Washington, D.C. or Jefferson City who understands what she needs. We have to support her foster care parents, her teacher, her principal, her church and community leaders in order to support her, and we have to return power to people. You know, Sheen and I have a 21-month-old son at home, and We've got another one on the way in less than two months. And we believe that education begins in the home. Education begins in the home. So whether our kids are being homeschooled, they're in private schools, or they're in public schools, as governor, we have to stand up and fight for those kids across Missouri to make sure that they get a chance at a quality education. And this has been done around the country. They found ways in some of these tough inner city school districts, in New Orleans, in Harlem, created great schools. We can do the same thing here in Missouri. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Bruner, your plan to fix failing school districts. With over 518 school districts, there are some that are doing a good job. But specifically, there are three school districts that represent 50% of those incarcerated here in our uh, state institution. I mean, it's sentencing people to jail, our young kids. Now, I've had teachers in my family for three generations. My grandmother's a teacher, my mother's a teacher, my daughter's a teacher. Teaching is very close to my heart. And as I've traveled across this entire state, I've heard two key issues. From superintendents everywhere, they're asking for flexibility, that one word answer from the superintendents. And then the local school boards, they want more control. They want the resources. They want to write the curriculums. You know, everything is, should be from a bottom up approach, not a top down. Continuing to take dictates from Jefferson City and Washington, D.C. by a few who feel what's best for all is obviously not working. And we can make our dollar go a lot farther. We can do a better job educating our children if we put the re resources, the responsibility, and the accountability back to the parents who want it, back to the uh, school boards, and back to the school superintendents. We can turn it around. I've done this in terms of bottom up approach. That's where we need to do it, right here across the state of Missouri. Mr. Kinder. I have a special passion for trying to reach the failing school districts, the kids who, and the parents who have their kids trapped in those school districts. And I've been involved over the last 15 to 18 years in helping start charter schools in the St. Louis metropolitan area and in Kansas City, where the districts, the mainline districts, have failed the worst. I have not always succeeded with each charter school I've been involved in starting, but some of them have succeeded wonderfully. And I think of the St. Louis Language Immersion Academy right here in the city of St. Louis or nearby, 
where the kids walk in in kindergarten and first grade, and if you go to the right, you, you're immersed in French all day, and if you go to the left, you're immersed in Spanish, and I helped, I chaired their fundraising dinner. There's a school that has actually brought parents back into the city so that their children could attend a school that wonderful. How about that for reversing the usual tide here? I say innovation, competition, more charter schools can meet these needs and be a beacon in the night to parents whose kids are trapped in failing urban schools. Michael Brown had graduated from one of the failed school districts two months before the trouble happened in Ferguson. We can offer more choices to parents. Charter schools work with Democrats, Republicans, and independents like I've worked with my friend Vince Shamel, the former mayor of St. Louis, to get, to get these charter schools some support. Very good. Our thanks to the uh, candidates tonight. Uh, we are going to take a quick break. You're listening to a live simulcast from the Jay Scheidegger Center on the campus of Lindenwood University. This is the Missouri Governor Candidates Forum for 2016. We'll be back with more live coverage right after this. Election 2016. Voted straight Republican. I voted straight Democratic. And FM News Talk 97.1 has you covered. I'm undecided. Log on to 971talk.com to get all the info and updates on candidates and issues. Just get out and vote. Including videos and the latest headlines. Plus, find your polling place and register to vote. It's a close race. Only one place has all the information you need to stay connected. Election 2016 on FM News Talk 97.1 and 971talk.com. Excuse me, what time are you guys leaving? We're gonna rob your house tonight. Don't you wish there were warnings to protect you from life's risks? With diabetes, there is one. It's called A1C, and you should know about it. When I'm working, things can get so hectic, so sometimes I need to find an easy way to express what's most important to me. Like with my crew, I use shorthand to tell them what I need. And when I need to talk directly to my fans. But the most meaningful shorthand of all is the one I use when I'm about to drive. Hashtag X. It's an easy way to tell everyone that I'm about to drive. And I do it every time before I get behind the wheel. Use hashtag X to pause the conversation before you drive. Because no text is worth a life. Hi, Mom. Hi, sweetie. How's it going, buddy? I'm bored. Go ride my bike. It may never be this easy to help your kids find balance, but you have more power than you know. The Weekend Parents Handbook and Website can help you maximize that power. You'll learn how to help kids choose healthier foods and how to make it fun for them to get active. Who can help kids maintain a healthy weight? We can. Visit the We Can website for a free parent's handbook plus tips, tools, and resources. A message from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. It's on us to stop sexual assault. To get in the way before it happens. To get a friend home safe. And to not blame the victim. It's on us. To look out for each other. To, to not, not look, look the, the other way. way. It's on us to stand up, to step in, to take responsibility. It's on us, all of us, to, to stop, stop sexual, sexual assault. assault. Learn how and take the pledge at itsonus.org. In Ferguson, we're serving up happiness. In Ferguson, we're serving up hospitality. In Ferguson, we're serving up peace. In 
Ferguson, we're serving up optimism. In Ferguson, we're serving up change. Ferguson is our home, and you're always welcome here. Welcome back to this special edition of the Mark Cox Show on FM News Talk 97.1. We are simulcasting our broadcast tonight from Lindenwood University for the Missouri Governor's Candidates Forum. Uh, we've gotten through uh, a number of questions so far. We're going to continue tonight. Just for those of you just joining us, our candidates uh, were selected their spot on the stage at random tonight. They drew numbers uh, to be one through four. We give each of them a chance to get a first answer at a question, and then we rotate those throughout the course of the evening. Uh, you can also watch this broadcast tonight if you're listening on 97.1 on our website at 971talk.com, or you can uh, go to either Charter or AT&T UVerse, where uh, LUTV, Lindenwood University Television, also carries the broadcast. Uh, on to our uh, next question tonight, and this will go first to Eric Greitens. What is your position on SJR 39, the Religious Liberty Bill? Yeah, great question, Mark, and an important question for us, because today in America, people of faith are under attack. You have the Obama administration trying to force nuns to accept birth control. You have the IRS targeting people of faith and religious nonprofit organizations. And that's why I respect and applaud the proponents of SJR 39 who want, as I do, to protect religious liberty. But I believe that this bill, as it's currently drafted, while well-intentioned, will have the unintentional consequence of threatening our economy and killing jobs. And we cannot afford to have more job-killing policies coming out of Jefferson City. And look, career politicians have set this up as a choice between actually protecting religious liberties and protecting jobs. And we don't have to make that choice. What we can do and what I will do as governor is I will protect the religious liberties of every Missourian. And when I'm governor, no pastor, no priest, no member of the clergy, no rabbi will ever be forced to participate in a ceremony that goes against their faith beliefs. At the same time, we can make this one of the top states in the nation to create new jobs and to protect quality, good-paying jobs here in the state of Missouri. You know, as a Navy SEAL, I was honored to serve in a United States military where we both protected everyone's religious liberty, everyone's religious liberty while we also ensured non-discrimination. And I'm going to bring that same common-sense conservative approach to protect the religious liberties of all Missourians. Mr. Greitens, thank you. Mr. Berner, please hold your applause, please. Thank you. You know, our First Amendment and uh, our Bill of Rights was first for a reason and for a purpose. Over 300 years ago, we had folks risking everything to come over for their religious liberty. And it's been the challenge throughout the centuries. Standing for our religious liberties is critical. Standing for our Bill of Rights in terms of our First Amendment of our Bill of Rights is absolutely paramount. You know, I truly believe as a business person that prosperity pursues freedom. And when there's more freedom, there's more prosperity. I also believe in our country should have the spirit of accommodation and not discrimination to live and let live, to respect one another, to respect their beliefs. We did this in our small business with people on the opposite spectrums of their religious beliefs and their principles. Not only did we get along, we became very, very successful and very prosperous and created jobs that lasted a lifetime. At the end of the day, it's about letting the people vote, not the legislature, not the governor. I say, let we the people have their voice. All right, Lieutenant Governor. I agree with Mr. Brenner on that part, point. My boyhood hero, Ronald Reagan, said the most important words in the Constitution are the first three, we the people, so I trust the people to vote. There are some on the other side of this issue who seem to believe that an aboriginal principle of the American founding, which is what religious liberty is, that is to say it predates the American founding, is for sale. I say it's not for sale. And I've been consistent on that throughout my career. When I was in the Senate, I led the effort and sponsored the bill that is in our statute book today. A Democratic governor signed it after I assembled a broad coalition to pass the Missouri Religious Freedom Restoration Act, RIFRA. 
It passed the Senate 31 to nothing and the House 122 to 10 and gave us that highest protection in statute. Now the question before us is different. Should the people of Missouri, whom I trust, have a chance to vote on this this November? It is well drafted. It had, we had input from a constitutional law professor at the University of Missouri leading in his field. It's been debated on the floor of the Senate and passed by an overwhelming margin. It is in the House committee that I hope it comes out of this coming week and goes to a positive vote in the House. And then it goes to your ballot for you to make the decision whether you want this in our Constitution. Again, we the people. Stand away. Before this, country was a, before this country was a country, people came to this continent seeking religious freedom and liberty. When we became a country, the very first amendment to our Constitution ensured the free exercise of religion and prohibited the government from establishing any religion. And to this day, the world is clamoring to come to the United States, to be part of our great republic. So no, I do not think that if we seek as a state to ensure religious liberties, that people are gonna walk away from this state. I disagree with those who say it's gonna prevent people from coming to this state, that it's gonna prevent people from bringing businesses to this state. And I do absolutely think that the people should have the right to vote on religious liberties. And that's what SJR 39 does. All four of us on this stage claim to be conservatives. Three of us support the right of the people to get to vote on whether religious liberties should be pro protected in our Constitution. If I'm governor, non-discrimination and the protection of religious liberties will be hallmarks of my administration. Thank you. And we probably should mention that uh, the next potential time that could be voted on by that House subcommittee is tomorrow evening. Uh, our next question, we'll start out with Mr. Bruner. When it comes to bringing jobs to Missouri, how would you make Missouri the most attractive state in the nation? Well, I'm the only one here running for governor who really understands this experientially for over three decades. Bringing jobs to Missouri is bringing hope and opportunity, and not just jobs, but careers. I've seen it happen in my small business where we grew this small business from 30 to 40 people, and we added thousands of opportunities for folks here in Missouri and across the country. Now, there's some basics here as a business person. Number one, I always felt that I was a lawsuit away from extinction. We need strong tort reform here in Missouri. I've been on the receiving ends of all kinds of frivolous lawsuits and the challenges here. And a lot of our lawsuits came from Texas because that was a good place to sue. And now when Texas changed that, they no longer have that as a venue to sue. You know, Missouri is listed number four in the nation as the best place to sue. The tort uh, uh, hellhole finan uh, financially attacking businesses. Number two, we need labor reform. This is basic competitiveness. We've seen the improvements here in Indiana and in Michigan. I've had manufacturing operations down in Tennessee. I see the value of labor reform. And number three, regulatory reform. This will bring the jobs, this will bring the business back to the state, and I'm ready to lead. Mr. Kinder. Job number one in improving our state's business and economic climate and job climate is passage of freedom to work legislation. A majority of states in this union today, with West Virginia most recently, are today right to work states. That gives the lie to the, acclaim, to the claim of the other side, Mr. Coster, that this is somehow some extreme measure. A majority of the states have adopted it, and they're moving ahead of Missouri. We have been losing congressional seats twice in the last 30-something years. We're on currently, we're, I fear we're on track to lose another one and go from eight to seven congressional seats in a state that, when I was grow growing up, had 10 congressional seats. We need right to work. Indiana passed it in 11, and Michigan in 12. Both are more union dominated than we are. In the most recent years, we have stats for 2014. Indiana was number one in the nation in manufacturing job growth, and Michigan was number two. This is a reform that can bring immediate 
beginning of a turnaround of our economy. We also need to get with the program on reducing our state's income tax in stages. At 6 percent, it's too high. We need judges who will be appointed, who will stand up to the trial bar and make it a more business-friendly place without infringing on anyone's rights. Those are the kind of judges I will appoint. Sanaway. Government doesn't create jobs. Hardworking Missourians do. That's why I have a five-point bold plan to get government out of the way. Number one, we do need to pass right to work because it's good for workers. The data says workers are making more money, wages are going up faster, and more of them have health insurance in the Midwest in right to work states. Number two, we have to have tort reform and a governor who will appoint conservative judges. Number three, on the very first day that I'm governor, I will freeze all new regulations until we can understand which regulations actually protect people. I'll give you one example of how overregulated we are. The regulation for barbers in this state is 10,000 words long. The book of Revelation is 10,000 words long. Surely we can tell a barber how many combs to have in fewer words than it takes to describe Armageddon. Number four, we have got to modernize and reduce the income tax in this state. And number five, we have to make sure that our workforce is ready for the jobs that are out there. There are great jobs as plumbers and sheet metal workers and allied health professionals and technicians. Not every child has to go to a four-year college. Seventy percent of Missourians are not college graduates. We're not out of step with the rest of the country. But we have to make sure that our young people know what great jobs are out there and have them prepared to take them. We can get our economy growing again. All right. Thank you. Mr. Greitens. Mark, this is the most important question that we're going to talk about tonight because people around Missouri are hurting. People have lost jobs, businesses are leaving Missouri. And politicians talk about this, but they fail to do the essential things that we have to do. We have to sign right to work. We have to end tax credit bribery. We have to reform the tax code. We have to cut regulations, and we, <clears throat> and we have to together, come together as a state and insist on the core priorities of government. We've got to get infrastructure right and public safety right and, and education right because the government doesn't create jobs, but the government creates the conditions in which businesses can grow and operate. I have run my own business. I also, when I came back home from my service as a Navy SEAL in Iraq, I started an organization called The Mission Continues. And I have worked with thousands of veterans around the country, helping them to come back home and get good private sector jobs and to start their own businesses. We have here tonight our very first veteran who we worked with here in Missouri, a guy named Tim Smith. Tim came home. You should see him after the forum. Tim came home. He was dealing with some post-traumatic stress disorder, some physical injuries. He went through our program at The Mission Continues. Today, he owns and operates his own business. It's a business called Patriot Commercial Cleaning. He's got 49 commercial cleaning contracts, and he hires other veterans. Tim's hired 42 other veterans. We've done this with veterans across the state. We know what it takes to work with small business owners and help to create the economy that we need and deserve here in Missouri. All right, Mr. Greitens, thank you very much. Just a reminder to our listeners at home on uh, FM News Talk 97.1, you are listening to a simulcast of the uh, Missouri Candidates Forum for 2016. We're joined here at the Scheidegger Center by Lieutenant Governor Peter Kinder, Catherine Hanaway, John Berner, and Eric Greitens. We'll continue now with our questions that were, of course, uh, turned in by the voters. And we'll start with Mr. Kinder on this one. What is your plan to deal with the flood of Syrian refugees to the U.S. as many of them will be naturalized to vote in three years? My plan is there are no Syrian refugees coming to Missouri, and I would stand up to the federal government and fight them. I was, uh, uh, until the federal government can prove to us that they've been properly vetted, that they, uh, that they have a passport that's a valid passport and not one that was cooked up by ISIS, because we know ISIS is doing that, um, this is really an outrage that the president is uh, attempting to foist on states Syrian refugees. You know, uh, it turns out that the perpetrators of the awful atrocities in, in San Bernardino had made it through whatever the federal government calls vetting today. Uh, now, come on. I mean, this is not, they're not serious about protecting this country when, the, when they say they can do that. I, I want to get back to the previous question on job creation and economic development and laud 
the tech uh, startup venture capital scene here in, Saint, in the St. Louis metro area from a few years ago. We were nowhere on this. Today we have Venture Cafe. We have a vibrant startup culture. Uh, if you haven't been to Venture Cafe, I urge you to go there, Google it, and go see it. Our tech center, our venture capital is, is really exciting and is one of the most promising things we have going for the future of our economy. All right, thank you. Just a reminder, the question, what is your plan to deal with Syrian refugees? Ms. Hanaway. Well, as governor, I would prevent any refugees from state sponsors of terrorism, like Syria, from coming to Missouri, unlike the current governor, who is welcoming them into Missouri, until we can find out for sure whether or not they are participants in terrorism, just as the lieutenant governor described. But we have to go further to protect our state from illegal immigration. It isn't just those coming from state sponsors of terrorism. It's all the illegal immigrants that are coming into our state. Just a little over an hour's drive from here, just a little over a month ago, a, name, a guy named Randy Nordman was murdered in his garage by a man who had just more murdered four guys, four people in Kansas, then drove across Interstate 70 until his car broke down and then he murdered the next person he met. That murderer came to the United States illegally, was deported, came back again in 2004, was arrested several times. As governor, I'll make sure that our law enforcement, when they are making arrests, if they have reason to suspect that somebody is here illegally, check their immigration status. Those murders were preventable. We should be preventing illegal immigrants from harming our state in every way that we possibly can. Mr. Gray. This is a problem that has been created by President Obama's failure. President Obama drew a red line, and then he failed to enforce it. President Obama has failed to take the fight to ISIS. And he's turned this into a political question and distorted the facts. President Obama talks about 10,000 refugees. There have been 10 million people who have been displaced by ISIS in Syria. And President Obama needs to take the fight to them. And let me tell you, as somebody who's been on the front lines fighting al-Qaeda-associated movements, they will stop at nothing. You can buy Turkish passports now for a couple of hundred dollars on the black market. And President Obama's own FBI director has said that they have no way to properly screen refugees. We have to take the fight to ISIS, and we have to win the fight with ISIS. And you know what? In the SEAL teams, they always said there's no prize in a gunfight for second place. You either win or you lose. And we are in a fight with ISIS, and we have to win this fight. Mr. Berner. Now, I've had the opportunity to talk to the governor of South Carolina specifically about this issue here. And she talked about uh, with me in terms of vetting. She said her husband, who served over in the Middle East, they could vet individuals because they were there serving with these individuals. But there's no vetting process. And she said the number one issue that we have is that the president and the State Department gives no communication to the governors across the states. They just basically dump these folks in on our states. Now, the number one way to solve this, folks, all you out here listening at home, elect a new president, a solid, strong Republican president, and elect a strong governor of Missouri and a good attorney general. And we'll put a stop to all this right away. It is unconscionable where we're heading and where we're going. And I would also further suggest that we not shut down Gitmo. We don't need any more terrorists coming back to our shores. It's back to common sense, and it's back to sticking to our core principles, and it's fighting for our, our principles. And as governor, number one is to protect the lives and properties of the citizens of Missouri. And I promise I will stand strong in protecting your lives and your property. Thank you very much. A, a related question now to that one. And we'll start off with Ms. Hanaway on this one. How do you feel about sanctuary cities, and what would you do about it if one was to try to come to the state of Missouri? I think sanctuary cities are a terrible idea for the reason that they provide sanctuary to illegal immigrants. And in addition to having a governor who is willing to support the notion that anyone who gets stopped for a crime who's suspected of being here illegally, we need a governor who has experience in dealing with 
illegal immigration. When I was a federal prosecutor, I prosecuted literally hundreds of those cases. We need a governor who's going to stand up for the men and women of law enforcement when they risk their lives to protect us and take on some of these challenges. I worked hand in hand with law enforcement when I was U.S. attorney. But the other thing we need is a governor who's going to stand up for your ability to protect yourself a governor who is going to stand up for your Second Amendment rights. I'm the first candidate for governor who's come out for constitutional carry and for campus carry so that if we do have some horrific situation where there's a, a, an attacker, either individually or in a large group setting, that you're going to have the right to protect yourself. I've always stood up for the Second Amendment. I've always stood up for law and order. That's precisely what I will do as the next governor of Missouri. Thank you. Mr. Greitens? When I'm governor, there will be no sanctuary cities in the state of Missouri. Sanctuary cities are a terrible idea. Instead of promoting sanctuary cities, we need to have a governor who's willing to stand up and support our law enforcement officers. You know what? Our law enforcement officers, especially after the crisis at Ferguson, they deserve to have a leader who knows what it means to put on body armor and wear a sidearm. They deserve to have a leader who understands what it means to say goodnight to your family and step into the dark and do dangerous work every single night. And when I'm governor, I will make sure that they always have the equipment, the training, and the support that they need to do their jobs. And I am always going to have the backs of those who are always on call for us. As governor, you need someone who will stand up and protect you, and that's what I'm going to do as governor. Thank you. Mr. Bruner. Sanctuary cities, <laughs> horrible, unconscionable. It's not going to happen. I pledge as your next governor, it will not happen on my watch. But my friends, we need some help here. If you elect me as your next governor, I have one more request. Elect a good, strong, fighting attorney general so together we can team up and stop this insanity. Very good. Mr. Bruner, thank you. Mr. Kinder? Sanctuary cities are an atrocity that we even tolerate them. Cities like San Francisco are doing today what South Carolina asserted the right to do uh, antebellum before the Civil War, and that is nullify federal law. And uh, a president named Andrew Jackson, a Southerner himself, told the folks in South Carolina, you continue on this and I'm going to send the Army down there and hang some of you uh, till you understand that I've made my point. Uh, sanctuary cities uh, are a virus that has arisen on the left liberal side of the American spectrum. They are lawless. They are an attempt to nullify federal immigration law. They have led to crime, further lawlessness, anarchy, and murders. As we've seen just in the last year, that precious young girl murdered in front of her father out in San Francisco by an illegal immigrant who had been deported once and uh, should never have been back in this country. But that happened in a sanctuary city. So sanctuary cities are an outrage I would not tolerate as governor, and I would speak out and work to prevent any from ever taking root in this state. Thank you. Just a reminder to those listening on FM News Talk 97.1 tonight, you're listening to a simulcast of the Missouri Candidate Forum. We are at the top of the hour. I want to let you know uh, what's going on here tonight during this special broadcast of the Mark Cox Show for people just tuning in. Let me get to the next question now, and we'll start off with Mr. Greitens on this one. Describe your position on photo ID requirements for voting. Yeah, Mark, this is very clear. This is a, an important question that's before the people of Missouri, and it relates to real ID. And again, career politicians simply have, have failed to deal with a question that's been lingering now for a decade. And we've got to a situation now where in Missouri, if you have a Missouri driver's license, you might not be able to go on to a military base. You might not be able to use your Missouri driver's license in order to take a flight to see a kid's college graduation or to visit a sick parent or grandparent. And we should make this very simple. You give people an option. You give people a choice. If people want to have an ID that meets the federal requirements so that they can fly, so they can go on to a military base, they should have that option. 
if they're concerned as I am about, about privacy, if they're concerned about making sure that they want the idea that they currently have here in Missouri, we should also have that option for them. This is very clear, it's very simple, and we can address this problem in a very clear way with strong leadership that gives the option to people to choose the ID that they want for them and for their families. Mr. Berner? I'm sorry, was that photo ID or real ID? Uh, well, just describe your position on photo ID requirements, the requirement to show a photo ID to vote. Yes, I, I, that's what I thought. Thank you very much. Sure. Uh, yes, photo ID has to deal with basically the integrity of our most valuable privilege in a representative democracy, in our republic. It's the right to vote. It's the confidence of all of those who participate in vote. And when that confidence is destroyed, and when the integrity is destroyed, then we have the cynicism that too often prevails. And particularly in certain areas of this state, they have a reputation for that, let's say, lack of integrity in the voting. We've had a breakdown already in the last election. We have a Secretary of State who failed to do their job, and that entire office failed to rush in. You know, this is basic common sense, my friends. Uh, you know, as a business person, it's always common sense. And maybe common sense is, comes about through decades of dealing with issues and the crucibles of life's experiences here, but it should be made available, accessible, plenty of opportunity to protect our most basic right. And I would, of course, support photo ID. Mr. Kinder. I support photo ID as well. It's common sense. You can't rent a movie at one of these rental places without showing a photo ID. You can't get on a train or an airplane or uh, uh, cash a check where they don't know you without showing a photo ID. Uh, check into a hotel, you need a photo ID. So many aspects of life, you need a photo ID. It seems to me a, a simple, basic matter of common sense. And I am confident that a big majority of Missourians uh, share that view and would vote for this, and I would hope the legislature would, again, trust the people, we the people, and put it out to a vote of the people, and to my Democratic friends, and I'm one up here who has some Democratic friends, who disagree with me. I do reserve the right to disagree with my friends. I would simply say the state will provide a free ID to anyone who doesn't have the resources to, to uh, acquire one, and then that, I think, should end the discussion. Ms. Hanaway. I support photo, uh, photo ID for voting. I think it should be required. It's the most precious right we have to go and cast one vote and have it count exactly the same, no matter who you are, where you're from, how much you're worth, that your vote will count exactly the same as someone, or, uh, someone else's. And that right is eroded when people are able to commit voter fraud. And sadly, Missouri has a history of the polls being held open late. The prosecutor of the city of St. Louis had her deceased parent registered to vote, I believe on the 10-year anniversary of the death of her parent. When I was a federal prosecutor, I prosecuted people who worked for ACORN, who went out and registered people to vote from fictitious addresses or with fictitious names. It isn't a fictitious problem. Voter fraud's a real problem. One way to address it and to ensure everyone's vote counts is to have photo ID. Very good. Just a reminder, the questions you're hearing tonight to the candidates were submitted by voters. Here's one that is related to the right to vote. And we'll start with Mr. Berner on this question. California has recently authorized undocumented aliens to obtain driver's licenses as well as the right to vote. Where do you stand on this issue? You know, it's amazing some of the issues that we're talking about today. Who would have ever guessed two years ago, three years ago, that this was even being talked about? Again, these is some of our most important values and our core principles in our republic here. And the fact that we have illegal aliens, and then we continue to give them benefits and continue to give them the right to vote and to drive a car, uh, this is absolute insanity being uh, uh, prevailing uh, across our country. And uh, obviously it tends to start with California and work its way uh, this direction. Uh, but we're not going to have this happen here in Missouri, 
And as governor, fortunately, as I've traveled across this state, we have a lot of common sense Missourians, back to basics, protecting our key values, our right to vote, the privilege of driving a car. All of these issues are common sense ideas. We just need to start standing strong for what makes sense, common sense, and protecting those principles of our, of our uh, republic. Thank you. Mr. Kinder. One of the finest uh, opportunities, responsibilities I've ever had as a public elected official is to speak at a naturalization ceremony. I don't know how many of our audience has ever attended one where these people from countries around the world have come here and gone through a years long process and renounce allegiance to any foreign crown or potentate, take an oath of allegiance to the United States of America, prove that they have gone through the necessary requirements for American citizenship, and you get a sense of the fact of the uniqueness the, um, that is American exceptionalism. America is an empire of the mind. Our shared history, our shared culture, the, the uh, cultural traditions and civic traditions that we were all taught as school children are being lost. And only in a state as, as taken over by crackpots as California could you have someone propose, could you have someone propose that undocumented aliens would have the right to vote? No, that's a right reserved to American citizens. Now, as for driver's license, I don't think Missourians look on that very, with much more kindness uh, than, but certainly not the right to vote. Uh, this, is, this is crackpot stuff that we've got to keep out of our state. Santa Wayne. I absolutely oppose any effort to give the precious right to vote to illegal immigrants or to provide driver's license. We have a rich history in this country. Almost all of us have a heritage of someone who came to the United States, but they came legally. They became part of this great country. My own maternal grandparents spoke Polish sometimes at home. Usually they fought or prayed in Polish, and sometimes I could tell the difference, usually. <laughs> but their children spoke English. They became part of the fabric of this nation. We cannot have wave after wave of people who are here illegally and not participating in the greatness of our nation. And of course it's California that's pushing this boundary. One of the people running for governor, one of the people on this stage is receiving more than half of their campaign contributions from outside the United States, I'm sorry, from outside Missouri. A, gr a huge proportion from California. One single donor has given a million dollars. That same donor is accused of sexually abusing a woman, and yet this candidate will not send that money back, won't send it to a woman's shelter, even though the person who made the contribution and is alleged to be sexually abusive has been terminated from his employer. John Kasich has sent, back his, has sent the donation to a women's shelter. And after this all came to light, the very next night, that politician Mr. went to a, an event with that donor. Mr. Greitens. Yeah. <clears throat> Mark, we're not going to have any. The question was about uh, illegal aliens voting. And we're not going to have any, any illegal immigrants voting in the state of Missouri. As somebody who's fought for this country overseas, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in Southeast Asia, in the Horn of Africa, America is an incredibly special place. And citizens who are here deserve to be protected by their leaders. And I'll tell you, from doing humanitarian work overseas, from having worked in Cambodia with kids who've lost limbs to landmines, kids who were survivors of polio, from having worked in one of Mother Teresa's homes for the destitute and dying, having worked in Rwanda with kids who lost their parents during the genocide, I can tell you that America is an incredibly special place. And we have to honor and protect our citizens who are here. So no, we are not going to have illegal immigrants voting in the state of Missouri. As governor, I'm going to stand up to protect the people of Missouri, to protect our citizens, as I've always done. Mr. Greitens, thank you. Please, please hold, hold your applause. Let me, let me move along here because we do have to get to a break at probably after this question. Um, this will go to Mr. Kinder first. What is your position on tort reform and loser pay laws? For, throughout my career, I have been a supporter and a fighter for tort reform. 
when I was Senate leader, I put those bills, led the effort to put those bills on Governor, then Governor Holden's desk, and he vetoed them. I led the override attempt, and we fell just short of the two-thirds necessary to override. This is a year, years-long battle that we finally were crowned with success in 2005 when we had a good conservative Republican governor in Matt Blunt who signed the tort reform bills placed on his desk in the first uh, two months of his administration in 2005. The problem is today that after 11 years post passage of those fine reform bills, the courts appointed by Democratic governors overwhelmingly since we've won only one race for governors since John Ashcroft left in 1988 or was reelected in 1988. The, the Democrats have appointed trial lawyer approved judges and no one not approved by them needs to apply and we've got to fight this battle all over again and I'm in it up to my neck. I'm shoulder to shoulder with other productive Missourians trying to get our legal system back on track through good tort reform like we passed in 2005. It's a battle, sadly, we have to do all over again. Ms. Hanaway? Because the Missouri Supreme Court keeps overruling sensible reforms that get made by the legislature, we have to have a governor who's going to lead to change the Constitution and how we select judges in Missouri. The trial lawyers control that process. The governor has to pick from one of three people nominated to him or her from a commission. The trial lawyers control those commissions. I think the governor should have the ability to pick any qualified Missourian to serve as a judge, and then the Senate confirm, can confirm. I'm the only candidate here who has put out a white paper in support of tort reform, in support of a modified version of loser pays. If we do that, then those who file frivolous lawsuits will have to pay the cost for filing those frivolous lawsuits, will take the economic incentive out of filing the frivolous lawsuits, will reduce the number of lawsuits. But if somebody is truly harmed through someone being abusive and seeking to harm someone, they'll still be the right and the ability to recover under Missouri law. There's a number of ways that we can improve your access to the courts, to justice, to putting judges on the record. I'm gonna lead on tort reform. I did when I was speaker. I'll do it when I w I'm governor. Thank you very much, Mr. Greitens. When politicians talk about things like tort reform, it can sound very abstract. We have to have tort reform because right now you have predatory trial lawyers who are out looking to attack doctors and businesses and individuals. And when they do this, they are driving good doctors out of practice. They are increasing everyone's insurance costs. They are forcing businesses to close down. They are costing people their retirement savings. That's why this is important. And as governor, as a constitutional conservative, I am going to appoint judges who are going to properly interpret the law, whose, whose decisions will be made and will be rooted in the Constitution. That's the kind of governor that you need to have. And in order for us to do all of that, you have to have a candidate who's going to be able to defeat Chris Coster. Chris Coster, whose campaign is funded by trial lawyers. And I cannot wait to face Chris Coster in the fall. Chris Coster, who spent his life as a lawyer and a politician, who is going to have to come up and fight against a leader who spent his, his life serving people. Chris Coster, our chief law enforcement officer who failed to show up at Ferguson, is going to f have to fight against a leader who's had the courage to go to the front lines. Chris Coster, who is on the front page of the New York Times, is one of the most corrupt attorney generals in the country, is going to have to fight against a leader who's running on a program of ethics reform to clean up Jefferson City. We get this done and protect real people, and we got to defeat Chris Coster in the fall. Mr. Greitens, thank you. Please hold your applause. Uh, Mr. Bruner, you, I think you touched on tort reform earlier. I, I did, and you know, this is not abstract. Uh, I've been face to face with these issues. And for all of you out there who are small business owners, maybe you're ranchers, maybe you're farmers, maybe you've just opened up a small cafe, this is a very, very real issue. In our industry, just recently here in St. Louis, so one person was awarded $72 million uh, against Johnson Johnson for baby powder. Th this is critical. 
as I said before, we're number four as a judicial hellhole in the country. I mean, California and New York are ahead of us, and the rest of the country are behind us. Now, you mentioned about loser pays. Now, there are some merits to that. I've done some review on that situation. That's the British system. I don't have a firm conclusion on that, but that does have merits. But I tell you what does have merits is what's happened with the Missouri plan that has been filed by many states across the country. It has been taken over by the trial lawyers. And it has been taken over by those who donate to trial lawyers. Chris Koster has received millions of dollars of campaign funds from trial lawyers. And what we have is a pro-lawsuit state in this, in, in this uh, uh, state here of Missouri. Now, what I would recommend here that we begin to study and review is the new Tennessee plan. That plan brings it back to the people. The governor appoints uh, the individual. Then both houses of the Tennessee legislature approve it. And then eventually, the people get a voice. Bring this back to the people. We can get control. In doing so, we're going to bring business back to this state, and we're going to bring jobs back to this state. Very good. Thank you. You are listening live to the uh, Missouri uh, Candidates Forum 2016, live from the campus of Lindenwood University on FM News Talk 97.1 and Lindenwood University Television. I'm Mark Cox. We're going to take a quick break, and we'll be back with much more right after this. Election 2016. Voted straight Republican. I voted straight Democratic. And FM News Talk 97.1 has you covered. I am undecided. Log on to 971talk.com to get all the info and updates on candidates and issues. Just get out and vote. Including videos and the latest headlines. Plus, find your polling place and register to vote. It's a close race. Only one place has all the information you need to stay connected. Election 2016 on FM News Talk 97.1 and 971talk.com. I'd like to finish school, but with kids and a job, I can't find the time to go to class. I have a few hours here and there. I would have to drive, park, and try to make it on time. Whoa, like that's a lot to ask. If I could find a program that worked around my schedule, I would do it. Lindenwood Online. Responsive faculty. Smooth registration. Quality education. We have your answers. Well, Mariah was bubbly and vivacious. If, if she came up and gave you a hug, she had to twirl you around in the process. And Mariah didn't know a stranger. It didn't matter who she was around or who was she with. She treated them like she knew them for the longest time. This is the text my daughter was reading when she drove into oncoming traffic. six stairs takes determination. So will getting into college. I've got what it takes. So do you. Welcome to my block party. Glad you can make it. The only triple doubles you get come with fries. Last time you blocked someone, you were online. I can do this all day. Your moves are just gay. Using gay to mean dumb or stupid, not cool. Not cool. Not in my house, not anywhere. It's not creative, it's offensive to gay people. And you're better than that.
So, same time next week? Well, of course. Put away a few bucks, feel like a million bucks. For free tips to help you save, Welcome back to, to this uh, special edition tonight of the Mark Cox Show on FM News Talk 97.1. We are simulcasting the Missouri Governor Candidates Forum live from the campus of Lindenwood University tonight. This is also airing, I should mention, on uh, Lindenwood University's television channel on uh, Charter and AT&T You can check it out there. You can also go to our website at 971talk.com. We've got a live stream up there as well. Uh, and that's an easy app to get on your phone, I'll just mention, by the way. Um, so uh, time for us to continue uh, with, with our candidates, and we will take this live right up to the top of the hour. So thank you for joining us tonight. Again, joined by Lieutenant Governor Peter Kinder, Catherine Hanaway, John Bruner, and Eric Greitens. And let us uh, continue now. And our next question will go first to Catherine Hanaway. What weaknesses do you see in the candidacy of Chris Coster, and how will you use that to defeat him? Well, that's a long list. I will start with his complete failure of leadership in Ferguson. He was the chief, state's chief law enforcement official when those riots happened. And ask yourself, who has he prosecuted for arson, for assaulting police officers, for stealing from those businesses? The answer is no one. I say if he can't do the job now that he has now, we should not promote him to be governor. But then when the protests happened at the University of Missouri and there was unrest there, he failed to show up again. Then there was the New York Times story that accused him of giving better settlements to people who had contributed to his campaigns. Front page, New York Times, above the fold. That's not a newspaper known for going after liberals. I think I present the greatest contrast with Chris Coster because I'm able to confront him on these issues as a former prosecutor. He's won two elections statewide saying he was all prosecutor and no politics. I'm the only Republican who has been in law enforcement. And no, I haven't strapped on a sidearm and put on body armor, but I've had marshals come to my house and warn that there'd been a death threat against me. I know what it's like to stand up for law enforcement. I know what it's like to be a prosecutor. I can put to the test Chris Coster's claims that he's all prosecutor and no politics, because indeed, he's all politics and no prosecutor. Ms. Hanaway, thank you. Mr. Greitens? Mark, it's really straightforward. Chris Coster is a lifetime politician. And people have had enough with politicians. They want a leader. And that's the contrast that we offer with Chris Coster. When things got hard and they were dangerous and difficult at Ferguson, Chris Coster failed to even show up. You know, he goes around bragging about the fact that he's got a badge in his back pocket. Our law enforcement officers know what it means to really serve. You got to tell Chris Coster that there's a difference between grabbing your coffee in the morning and walking into a courtroom and putting on your sidearm and walking into the streets. We have to support our law enforcement officers, and that's a great contrast that we offer. It's also very clear that Chris Coster is a corrupt politician. And we're running on an ethics platform to ban all gifts from lobbyists, to close the revolving door between legislators and special interests, and to insist on term limits for every statewide office holder. Chris Coster is a politician who spent his life creating problems, and I'm going to be happy to run against him as a leader who spent his life solving problems, fighting for people on the front lines. And you know what? As your leader, this fall, we are not only going to beat Chris Coster. As Republicans, we're going to win all of the statewide offices. Uh, Mr. Bruner. You know, the number one issue as we get across the state and in all these forums and debates, it's jobs and the economy. That is the pressing issue. And the question out there are who are the citizens of Missouri going to hire to fix that problem? Now, with Chris Coster, we have a political flip-flopper. We have a trial lawyer. I mean, hey, it's great for business, as I said earlier, in Missouri to, to sue and, and bring all your trial lawyer's friends together and get trial lawyers elected to political office. But that is totally opposite of what we need here in Missouri. I mean, Chris is a nice guy, 
but nice guys aren't going to bring the jobs back to Missouri. What we need in Missouri is a successful CEO who's brought jobs back, who's done it, and will continue to do so. We need somebody who is truly an outsider with a fresh perspective and ideas, not a lifetime politician. And we need a lifetime constitutional conservative and a person that puts their faith in action. You know, Missouri does not need Chris Coster. Chris Coster is bad for Missouri. I would suggest that John Bruner is the answer for Missouri. Mr. Kinder. Chris Coster is wrong for Missouri, but he's won two statewide elections. No other person on this stage has ever done that. I've won three times, as I've said before, because I figured out a way to unite r urban and rural Missouri sufficiently and to get a few more votes in what are usually minority precincts and still carry 109 counties across this state. I'm the one who can take the game to Chris Coster. He is the candidate of the status quo. He's the candidate who says the Nixon, Obama, Coster economy is just fine. No major course corrections are needed. We don't need to reform our labor laws to make them more flexible as other states that are faster growing and stealing our congressional seats are doing. He says we're just doing fine and we just need to trust him. I don't think the voters of Missouri are going to trust him if we have a cheerful, confident, optimistic leader who can unite the majority Republican Party in this state who doesn't pit one part of this state against another, but rather seeks ways to unite all Missourians by saying we're all in this together. I went to Ferguson to announce my candidacy, and I'm the only candidate who's ever done that, in July of last year, and I pointed to the explosion of violent crime that has happened in the St. Louis region after Ferguson that the police chief called the Ferguson effect. It happened on Chris Coster's watch, and that is a set of facts laying out there to be discussed in the fall campaign. All right, I will do you. it. Our, our next question to Mr. Greitens, our next voter question. Would you promise never to sign a tax increase, including a gas tax, sent to you by the General Assembly? We are not going to sign tax increases and increase the tax burden on the people of Missouri. And unlike my, some of my opponents who have suggested that we should increase gas taxes, I think we should not increase taxes on the people of Missouri. Every time you hear a politician talk, they're always talking about raising taxes, about raising taxes. We have people right now, politicians in Jefferson City, who are talking about raising the gas tax, and yet they haven't said to the people of Missouri what they're going to get for the money that they spend. We see this problem again and again with career politicians, is that the answer to everything is always raising taxes instead of focusing on results and accountability. That's what leaders do. The problem in Missouri is not that we have a revenue problem. The problem in Missouri is that we have a spending problem. And there are ways to tackle the serious problems that we're facing in Missouri without creating another problem by raising taxes on the people of Missouri. Mr. Berner. You know, it's unfortunate that so often uh, those in politics uh, run for tax increases to solve the problems. And I can understand it. They've never had experience running a business. Uh, they've spent uh, most of their time in politics. And maybe they just haven't had that training. But as an entrepreneur, the last thing I would ever do is go to our customers and say, I got to ask for a price increase. And I know what the answer is. I don't think so. We'll go to the competition. And so what Missouri needs here in this state is not pledges and no taxes and all those nice political insider type of, of lines, but you need to hire an entrepreneur, a business person who brings in as the outsider creative ideas, initiatives that I've done in my business that works here in the state of Missouri. And we find good people. I've interviewed thousands of people. We find good people, good leaders that clear accountability, bring entrepreneurship back to the state, and we can find huge opportunities for the state. I've done this for 30 years. I'll do it again here in Missouri. That's what we need. Find a way to do a better job with less money, faster, quicker, better service. As an entrepreneur, as a business leader, I'll do this as governor, as your governor here in Missouri. Mr. Kinder. I do not support a fuel tax increase. And I do not support the proposal that is currently before the legislature and proposed by uh, one senator who's strongly pushing it. I, he's a friend of mine. I respect him. 
and the motives he brings to this debate, but I disagree with him. I will say that if it were possible to significantly reduce our income tax, which is at 6% is too high, and you could invest more money by going to the people and say, you're getting a net tax cut. Will you consider, under that circumstance, of drastically redu reduced income tax rates, at least discussing more resources for transportation can be part of the discussion. But I do not favor it at this time. I would favor it if, perhaps, and only if, I could be shown that the net tax burden on Missourians was, le was lessened by those two actions, reduction in the income tax rate that is holding us back at 6%, way too high, in exchange for possibly considering investing more in, edu in, in, excuse me, in transportation. Ms. Hanaway. I've traveled all over the state. I've been at literally hundreds of events during the course of this campaign, and not one single person has come up to me and said, please raise my taxes. I'm not going to raise anybody's taxes. I'm certainly not going to raise the income tax. In fact, there are nine states across the United States that don't have income taxes. We have to compete for, with them for jobs. And so I think the path forward for Missouri is to modernize our income taxes, to reduce our income taxes. Now, over time, might it make sense if we sent out to the vote of the people a reduction in the income tax and reprioritized, and if the people want to invest more in roads, that if there is a reduction in the income tax and they want to reprioritize that spending on roads and invest through the fuel tax, that might be one way to do it, but the people should get to decide. And here's the most important point, the total tax burden on Missourians. State, local, fuel, sales, income tax has got to come down. The Post-Dispatch likes to talk about us being a low tax state. We're right in the middle of the pack. We are not competitive if we are right in the middle of the pack. We have got to be better because we don't have fuel, we don't have coasts. We have got to be a pro-business, pro-growth state, and that starts with reducing the income tax. Thank you. Our next question it deals a lot with the impact of money on candidates and our political process. What is your, uh, Mr. Bruner, what is your position on wealthy billionaires, is the question, influencing Missouri politics? Well, fortunately, I don't fit into that category. But I have been very successful, and I'm grateful for the free enterprise system and all that we've been able to accomplish here in Missouri, and that's why I'm running for governor to make it happen. But you know what we really need here is greater participation from the citizens across the state, the $5 and $10 contributions, the $100 contributions. Uh, I got a message from an individual from Kansas City. She says, my Social Security check has not come in, but it'll be in next week, and I'll write you a check for $5. Uh, this is greater participation from across the board is absolutely critical. Now, I know the opposition, the Democrats, want to put uh, limits on uh, campaign contributions, and I honestly haven't figured out what the answer is. But I do know when I ran against Claire McCaskill that I was told that over 30 years in politics that she had built up a name ID worth between 15 and 20 million dollars. And so I believe that challengers who come into politics to take care and go after those who are established, the career politicians, need to have greater flexibility because they've built up that brand name and that brand ID for, for maybe decades. And it's important that the establishment be challenged and have the resource to do so. Transparency is always important in our politics and our political system. So greater participation from a broader group of people, uh, greater transparency, and the ability for challengers to come in with more resources to take out <laughs> the incumbents. All right, thank you. Mr. Kinder. Uh, I have some personal experience that is unmatched on this stage on this matter in that four years ago, three or four billionaires, uh, or close to billionaires, lined up against me. And uh, I was outspent in my primary by somewhere between a million five and two million dollars. Uh, I nonetheless prevailed. I was uh, savagely attacked, brutally attacked, personally attacked in that race, and I prevailed. Uh, I took my case to the people. The people shrugged their shoulders and said, uh, we're going to endorse Kinder for another term. Uh, 
I believe the answer to money in politics is disclosure, full disclosure to you, the people. Again, I trust the people uh, to see who's donating how much to which candidates and make up your own mind. I am not the candidate of bi-coastal billionaires pouring six-figure checks into this state to try to buy the governor's mansion. I am not that candidate. I am Please a candidate who has 410 voter, uh, Missourians in the last uh, period, the, the, the quarter just ended, who donated $328,000 to my campaign. And I'm very proud that I'm doing this one donor at a time. And you know what? They're all voters. And I am seeking contributions because it's a very expensive proposition from Missourians of goodwill, Democrats and Republicans and independents who understand, as I do, that we're all in this together. By the way, you didn't hear me whining about that about anything that was done to me four years ago. It's part of the game. Ms. Hanaway? Transparency is the most important thing in campaign finance, because if we have complete transparency, then they, you can know precisely who is supporting each of us. If you look at my campaign finance records, you'll find that I have the most contributions from individual Missourians. I have the lowest percentage of money raised from outside Missouri. You'll also see that I have one contributor whose name is probably very familiar to you if you read the Post-Dispatch. His name is Rex Singfeld. Now, let me tell you that he, he gave me a very large campaign contribution in total about a million dollars. But he is one contributor. I also have a contributor in Kansas City who gave me $4. If you want to know who I am, look at my record. I was for right to work. I was for lower taxes. I was for tort reform when I was Speaker of the House 12 years ago. I didn't know Rex Singfeld then. After he moved back to Missouri, he examined my record and chose to support me. I'm glad to have his support. He lives here in Missouri. I've looked down the face of hardened criminals. I've prosecuted high-ranking officials and corporations for white-collar crime. I've always been independent. I will be independent, and I'm going to put together the resources to win this election. Mr. Greitens. You know, Mark, people in Missouri are tired of politics as usual, and they want somebody who's tough enough to go in and shake up Jefferson City. And that's why, since we've entered this race, we've raised more money from people in Missouri than all of the other candidates. And what people are saying is, we want a leader that we can trust. And yes, we have to have transparency, but we also have to have a real ethics program. And that's why I've said that as governor, we are going to ban all gifts from lobbyists. We're going to close the revolving door between legislators and special interests. So if you're a legislator and you decide that you want to become a lobbyist, my proposal is very simple. If you've served one year, then you need to wait for one year before you become a lobbyist. If you serve for two years, you want to become a lobbyist, then you've got to wait for two years before you become a lobbyist. And if you're a career politician and you've served for 20 years, then you need to wait for 20 years before you become a lobbyist. We have to close the revolving door between legislators and special interests, and we also have to insist on term limits for every statewide office holder. The people of Missouri deserve to be able to trust their government, and they have to be able to trust their governor. And I'll also take this opportunity, if you're listening or you're, or you're here today and you want to join our movement and you want to donate, go to ericgreitens.com. Because I know that with strong conservative leadership from outside of Missouri, join our movement to take our government back. All right. Thank you very much. Just a reminder, those listening on radio, you are listening to the Missouri Governor Candidates Forum. Uh, we are going to be able to probably get to one more question tonight before we get to our closing statement. So I'll just let you know that before I get started on this one. How about that? Uh, I will read this as it's written. This comes directly from a voter. It's obviously directed to the candidates, not any specific candidate. But Ms. Hanaway, you'll have the opportunity to answer this first. I agree with you on the issues, and I love what you're saying. The problem is I've heard this a million times before by other candidates in other election cycles, so why should I believe a word you're saying? Great question. <laughs> Fabulous question. What I would ask every voter to do is take a look at my record. I have a record as a mom, as a prosecutor, as someone who's been in public service, but somebody who's also been in the private sector. I'm 52 years old. I've held elected office for six of those years. 
Look at how I voted in the legislature. Look at the kinds of crimes I prosecuted as a prosecutor. And look at the plans that I have laid out that are very specific on each and every one of the issues. I'm willing to take a position on religious liberties. I'm not for it and against it. I support religious liberties. I'm willing to take a position on voter identification. I'm willing to take a position on whether or not I'm going to raise your taxes. I support right to work. Go right down the line, but then go back and compare it with what I've done in the past, how I voted, what I've stood for, what I said then, and how I voted then. I'll always stand up for the innocent unborn. That's why when I was Speaker of the House, we passed the first ever 24-hour waiting period on abortions and ended public funding. If I get to be governor, we're going to end Planned Parenthood funding once and for all. I'm always going to stand up for our constitutional rights. Mr. Greitens. If you're tired of talk and you want action, then vote for a leader who spent his life taking action. I'm the only person who's never run for office before. My opponents, respectfully, have been in 20 different elections. Now, if they were going to make a difference, they would have done it already. I've spent my life taking action as a Navy SEAL. I've spent my life taking action when I came back and I started my own business. When I came back home and I started an organization called The Mission Continues to help our returning veterans to come home and to reintegrate successfully, to start their own businesses, to get quality private sector employment. And we got people who came back and got engaged in the community. You want to talk about what leaders do in action? They bring people together to take action. If the mission continues, we started with my combat pay. It's $2,500. But people came together from around Missouri and around the country, and we said, we're going to make sure that we solve this problem and that this generation of veterans is able to come home and continue to serve and to continue to lead. And you know what? We've had over 100,000 people who've come out and volunteered with us. And if we want to solve our problems together in Missouri, it's going to take a leader who's willing to call on others to take action, to take back our streets, to fix our broken schools. It's going to take a leader who's used to taking action, and that's the opportunity that this campaign, Greitens for Missouri, offers the people of Missouri. Mr. Berner. You know, I uh, understand the cynicism that comes in. You vote for people that you believe in, and then they sorely disappoint you and let you down. And I've interviewed thousands of people in my lifetime, and, and I always try to determine, is this the right person? And one of the key issues is to determine what they've done in the past, and I mean, that's the best indication of what they're going to do in the future. And trying to find that right person is everything. So it, it is so critical that you vet the candidates. And folks, I, I, I'm not a public speaker. I haven't spent a career in public speaking. I've, I've never been paid thousands of dollars to speak uh, in public as one of my opponents. I've been on the plant floor working hard, creating jobs. I'm investing my own money in this campaign, and I can't be bought. I'm doing this only because I care. I care for the citizens of Missouri. I, I want the spirit of free enterprise to go across this state. And I'm tired of those well-meaning people that we continue to elect over and over again and expect different results. Well, wasn't that Einstein's definition of sanity, continuing to do the same thing? and and, and expecting different results. So keep vetting, keep drilling down, look at a person in the eye and say, can I trust this person to do what they say and have they done it in the past? I hope to earn your vote and your confidence and I hope to be your next governor. Mr. Kinder. I believe the lady asked the question, why should I believe a word you say? Uh, my answer to her may startle you, don't believe a word I say. Don't take my word for it. Take the National Rifle Association's word for it, the highest A-plus rating. Take Missouri Right to Life word for it, Battling for the Unborn, Defender of Life Award. Go out and ask the activists who've been battling against Common Core the last three and a half years in our state, who's been battling alongside them, see what they say. Go out and ask the, the, those who are battling for property rights, who stood with them in all of these battles. They'll tell you I have. But ask them. Don't, don't take my word for it. Inquire about my reputation here within the St. Louis metropolitan area for working with Democrats, Republicans, and independents, 
minorities, blacks, whites, Hispanic, to move our state forward, to improve our neighborhoods, to found charter schools that do a better job than the failing urban systems that have brought us so much sorrow, who've worked with them on housing issues and school choice and all these other things and didn't ask anybody's politics. That may be why I survived in 2008, a bad Republican year, and again in 2012 when no one else did. So don't take my word for it. Mr. Kinder, thank you. Uh, it is time now for us to start our uh, closing statements tonight, and uh, we will do that in the reverse order that we did opening statements. Uh, the candidates will have two minutes each for their closing statements. We'll start with Mr. Greitens. On March 28, 2007, uh, I was serving in Iraq as a commander of an al-Qaeda targeting cell. Uh, that morning, my team was hit by a suicide truck bomb. I was very fortunate that that day there was a Marine named Travis Mannion who ran across the compound. He was the first person who came to my aid that day. And later, when they told me that I had to go to the hospital, I turned to Travis and I said, hey man, you got it? And he said, yes sir, I've got your back. And that was the last thing that I ever heard from Travis Mannion because a couple of weeks later, Travis died defending his fellow Marines in Fallujah. We are only here because thousands of men and women like Travis Mannion and others have gone before us, have served and have sacrificed for us. And when I came home from Iraq, I went to visit Travis's family, to visit his parents. And I told them that his values of service and of sacrifice would live on. Think now about your own parents, your own grandparents, your own church and synagogue leaders, your own coaches and mentors and teachers who've served and sacrificed for you. I'm asking you to join me in this mission so that our values of hard work and personal responsibility, of service and of sacrifice live on. And you know what? Politicians are going to offer you something to complain about. I'm offering you something to fight for. They're going to make excuses about why things always have to stay the same. Together, we can take responsibility for making things as they should be. And if we meet their false promises with our proven solutions, we'll win. If we meet their efforts to confuse with our insistence on common sense, we will win. And if we meet their corruption with our courage, we will win. And together, we'll turn Missouri around. Together, we will build a Missouri that we are proud to pass on to our children. And together, we can make sure that Missouri's best days are still ahead of us. Thank you, and God bless you. Mr. Greitens, thank you. Please, please hold your applause, Ms. Hanaway. Thank you very much. Thank you to the listeners at home for tuning in. A little more than 13 years ago, a woman half a world away that I'll never meet became a hero of mine. She chose life. And because of her decision, we have a son. And we went to Eastern Europe to adopt a son. We went through the courts there we saw what communism had done to those countries. We saw the freedoms that had been denied to the people there. And if I have the chance of being your next governor on the day I take that oath of office, I'll have the Constitution in my head, my hand on the Bible, and in my heart, one very special moment as we came back from Eastern Europe and came through all those processes and procedures, and finally the last customs agent we saw said, Congratulations, Mr. and Mrs. Hannaway. Your son's an American. Now, I'd probably heard that word with my ears a million times before. But in my heart, I understood it in a completely different way. I understood that because of our Constitution, because of the sacrifices that men and women have spilt blood for, he was going to be able to pray as he wanted, to speak as he wanted, to think as he wanted. Ronald Reagan said that freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction because it's not passed through the bloodlines. Each generation must sacrifice for it. So to me, this election is about the sacrifices that we will all make for the next generation so that they can have the opportunities that we inherited so that they can have the freedoms that are preserved in our Constitution. So I ask you humbly to join me in this movement, to bring jobs to Missouri, not just to win elections, but to restore our Constitution and make our state safe and strong again. Thank you, and God bless you. 
Mr. Kinder. I make my appeal to all Missourians and to you in this primary electorate on the basis of a strong record of accomplishment. I think you've got to consider who you're going to send up against Chris Coster. He is a formidable candidate. Kid yourself not. He has won twice statewide. No other person on this stage has ever found a way to put together a majority and win a statewide election. You can trust me to actually win an election, which I think is what we Republicans need after we're tired of winning only one of the last six races for governor. To do that, you'll need a cheerful, confident, optimistic leader who can unite our party, all wings of our party, all aspects, urban and rural, as I've been able to do in three statewide runs, and lead a united party to victory in November. You need not only a trusted winner, but you need a trusted conservative. I was inspired as a boy by the leadership of Ronald Reagan. I was for him when he was governor of California, and I was in grade school, and then through high school and college. I was a delegate for Ronald Reagan. And through my time, my little time in public life, I have maintained fidelity to the principles of Reagan conservatism. And if you want to cite a battle on the conservative side in this state in the last 15 to 20 years, I've been in the thick of it, delivering wins for our side. I've won when no one else did. I stood up against Obamacare and fought that fight, as I've fought so many other fights, when no one else would. And on the basis of that strong record, where I've not just talked the talk, but walked the walk, I humbly ask for your support as we head into a victory in November. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Berner. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you tonight and for you at home as well that was watching or listening. Again, I want to give a salute to our veterans that give us the freedom and provide us the opportunity to have these debates and forums. You know, all across our state, not just running for governor, we need people of character, people of competence, and people of courage to step into the gap in this trial of these really tough times. You know, as John Bruner's governor, you'll get a businessman, a go-to, can-do, get-it-done person. You'll get an outsider, a lifetime constitutional conservative, and a man of faith who believes in putting his faith in action and defending and protecting our religious liberties. But to win this election, we need a compelling contrast. And that's the only way we're going to do it, because every election cycle is different. The past is no indication of future election cycles, and the 2018 will be different. But up against Chris Coster, we can put up between a trial lawyer that kills jobs and a businessman that creates jobs, between a liberal insider or a conservative outsider, between a politician or a Marine. And that's a compelling contrast with John Bruner in this race that will win this election. Now, my friends, the state here, we had an election here, uh, presidential, uh, divided the state in half, a couple thousand votes between Donald Trump and Ted Cruz. And I understand those who voted for Donald Trump, you know, they want an outsider, a person to get things done, a business person. I understand the folks who voted for Ted Cruz, they want a strong constitutional conservative, a person of faith. Folks, I bring those together because we're going to need unity. As John Bruner's governor at the top of this ticket, we can pull the state together. We can pull the folks together, and we can get jobs back. We can take this country back, my friends, one state at a time. I believe it with all my heart. It begins right here in Missouri. May we, as George Washington did, make an appeal to heaven because the challenges are great. And may God continue to shed his grace and mercy on America. Good night. Thank you very much. Thank you to our candidates, Peter Kinder, Catherine Hannaway, John Bruner, and Eric Greitens. You've been listening live to the Missouri Governor Candidates Forum on FM News Talk 97.1 of the Mark Cox Show and on Lindawood University Television. Uh, our thanks tonight to the candidates for showing up to our live audience here. You've been great. Thank you for abiding by the rules for the most part. We appreciate that. Thank you to uh, Alan Lederbrand, who's been my timer tonight. He did a great job for us. Thank you to the St. Louis County and St. Charles County Republican Central Committee for sponsoring this to begin with, and we'll have it available on demand by tomorrow at 971talk.com. We'll see you tomorrow at noon on The Mark Cox Show. Good job. Thank you. Please be seated.
the audience I see. Um, and uh, we also want to thank Bob Cook and his team here at Lindenwood. Amazing people. Did this not go smooth and beautiful? This was a great event. Yeah. We need to put a big thanks out to 97.1, Jeff Allen, Tim Ewill, Ewill and his crew, and our moderator, Mark Cox.